Welcome back to Afternoon Garage. So here it is, folks, my 2012 Fisker Karma in Earth, which is the color that they call it. Had this car for about three or four years now. Really kind of enjoyed driving the car. Uh, had a few issues here and there, and kind of go over that a little later. Right now, this car is pretty hot on the internet. Doug DeMuro did a review of the car. And so that's the 2012 Fisker Karma. Which I thought was pretty unbiased review. There's been other people who have done reviews of the car uh, complaining about different things that are really kind of insignificant, like choking on the exhaust. This is something I actually didn't know about. I had no idea that the gas motor exhaust on the Fisker was right here behind the front wheel. But Doug did a pretty good job. Another thing that he did was he, uh, he kind of had an unbiased review and told um, different, a few different things about the car. The weirdest part about this though is that when you press a button and the gear is engaged, a beam of light shines like from this gear selector into the dashboard. It is really strange. However, he's not really an owner of a Fisker Karma. So getting advice from Doug DeMiro about daily ownership of a Fisker Karma, you're not gonna find out much information. I'll tell you problems that you'd come across if you own this car. I first fell in love with this car on a trip to Vegas. So I went to Las Vegas, uh, stayed about a week, and um, I ran across this car. They have a Fisker dealer, or did have a Fisker dealer back in 2012, in, uh, right in the Las Vegas area. And boy, I saw one of these cars from the side profile and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Kind of looked reminiscent of maybe a BMW Z8 or something like that. I knew it had uh, influences of maybe an Aston Martin and that kind of thing. I really didn't know much about it. After I crawled all over it and uh, looked it up, well, I found out it was a all electric car. I was very impressed. I had to have one. Fast forward about six years. One came up on Craigslist, very near my home. I drove up to Seattle to go look at it, maybe arrange a test drive. Now, the price had dropped significantly from the original sticker price, which I have here, which is in the window. You can see that the car retailed for $120,000 or so, which is a lot of money for a car. Now, when I went and answered the Craigslist ad, it was just half that. It was $59,999. Not sure where he came up with that number, but uh, let me tell you, after knowing that one was available in my area, I could drive it, pick it up tomorrow, man, I was in. That was the worst car purchase I think that I ever made. I think that if I have any car purchases like that where I'm really kind of emotionally involved in a car, much better off hiring somebody for, I don't know, say $1,000 to go up there, do some negotiation, because what I did was I went in there, showed all my cards, I was just completely amazed at the car, and I was willing to pay him any kind of money he wanted for the thing. Not a good buying decision. Now this car came out about the same year as the Tesla Model S, 2012, and uh, it was in direct competition with that car. Tesla Model S, not a very attractive looking car, in fact today I think it looks like uh, a late model Ford Fusion, but you know, looks like a bunch of different cars out there. But this thing here, this thing looked different than anything else on the road. With the wheelbase at 122 inches, and uh, this fantastic looking grille on the front end, man, I was hooked. Um, I still like this. There's a lot of people who kind of just don't like the the shark teeth look, look on the front, but I think it's kind of tasteful. This car was far superior to anything that the Tesla Model S was back in the day. So the Tesla Model S had old technology 18650 batteries. Well, this has prismatic pouch cells, which were uh, the latest technology. One of the few production cars I know of that came stock with 22 inch wheels, wide tires, and factory Brembo brakes. Another thing I like about the car is how they pushed the front and the rear wheels as far forward and as far rearward as possible, making for a fantastic looking car. But like any competition, someone's got to come out the victor, someone's got to come out ahead, and unfortunately this lost. It's kind of like uh, back in the 80s where you had VHS and Betamax. Betamax was made exclusively by Sony and was a much better machine. Tapes were a little bit smaller, 
a little bit less recording time, however, much better quality. That's kind of how this car is here, where um, you have real heavy car, lots of torque, lots of horsepower, and unfortunately, the Tesla Model S came out ahead because it's more of a realistic electric car where you have little skinnier tires, you know, and you try to get as much gas mileage as you can or electric charge per mile as you can out of the battery pack. And you know, that car won. Another thing that kind of led to the Fisker Karma's demise was there was a Consumer Reports test on this car and uh, they took it right off the trailer. Right away, the battery light came on and had suffered from a catastrophic battery failure right on the test track. The car doesn't go in gear. It doesn't move. The dealer has to come with a flatbed and take it away. And hopefully they can fix it. In fact, they never even got a chance to drive it. They just uh, loaded it right back on the trailer and then they reported it as such. The Fisker Karma was then plagued with a bunch of battery issues which uh, led the Fisker company into bankruptcy. And eventually the company dissolved. It's picked up by a company called Wenzang, which is a Chinese company. And I was really thinking that they were going to take the car and uh, just kind of change a few things. Maybe the infotainment system, which is kind of laggy. Just kind of leave it alone. But they didn't do that. They changed things that I really find appealing about the car. Like the front grille, the headlights are a different shape, and even the tail lights look a little bit different. Not really thrilled with all the changes that they made, but hey, you know, auto companies, they gotta make that change or it's just not distinguished from the original model. I think that's kind of what they wanted to do. They kind of just wanted to make it their own. Another thing that they got rid of, which is a real sad thing for me to see, was the solar panel on the roof. It's one of the things that kind of attracted me to the car was uh, it has this uh, solar panel, which I had the impression of it charging the batteries and it does charge the batteries, but only the 12 volt battery. There's no way for this energy to get into the high voltage battery. And if you could, it would probably take something like three years of constant sun to actually uh, reach a full charge. Yeah, the solar panel really doesn't do a whole lot of anything but charge that 12 volt battery. But what it does do is it senses that there's a lot of sunlight and then it runs the blower on the inside of the car. So, you know, when you get in, it's not going to be 120 degrees in there, you know, because you've got uh, air flowing in there. It's another reason why you walk past one of these cars and you can typically smell uh, fresh interior or leather or that kind of thing because, you know, there's always this constant pressure on the inside. Another thing that's really interesting about these Fisker Karmas and this solar roof here is that the Fisker Karma is one of the only cars that's powered by three energy sources. Solar, internal combustion engine, and high voltage battery pack, which you can charge. So even though this doesn't actually charge the high voltage system, uh, it does provide power to the 12 volt battery. So it is part of the whole operation of the car. And as a bonus, it's really nice getting in on a nice summer day and not having it really hot in here. I like that. All right, here's something to look out for here. Underneath this cowl, there's a series of drain holes in there. There's one there, and there's one there where the wipers are. You can see that right down there. Um, anyway, what's what'll happen here is it'll clog with uh, leaf debris or maybe even real heavy pollen during the summer, and then you get water kind of pooling up, collecting in here. What you don't want to do is get a lot of water in the cowl. And uh, let me tell you why that is over on the other side. Over on this side of the car, you have an access cover right here for the cabin air filter. Kind of just fits inside of here. What happens here is this. If you uh, end up trying to pressure wash all this stuff out of here, what will happen is you get water down inside of here. Uh, water can actually drip down on something called the CIU, which is right in the dash on the inside of the vehicle. Well, when that happens, it uh, causes a little bit of electrical resistance on some uh, connector in there, and eventually the thing fails. So definitely want to make sure and keep water out of this area right here. So if you ever have the car doing something goofy, here's the hard reset connector. Basically, it just has kind of like a tab that you press down, you pull the connector out, 
you let it out for maybe 30 seconds and then uh, you plug it back in again. Basically, it's kind of a hard reset of the car. Um, so if you ever have anybody telling you where to, to do a hard reset, there's your connector right there. Another thing you'll commonly see is you'll see these corners start to kind of pick up here. Uh, it'll just kind of start peeling up right from here. So what I usually do with this is, is I'll take and I'll clean the adhesive off. Then I'll take some maybe windshield urethane or something like that and try to clamp it down. It happens on the front here. And it also happens in the rear. It just starts kind of curling up and it's kind of annoying. It's not a big deal, but it's got to be fixed. Another problem you'll find with this car, this is a body problem. What will happen is, is this will come unattached. Mine's kind of, actually just kind of coming off now. I think the solution to that is kind of get in here with once again some windshield urethane and a clamp and try to press that back down on there and glue that panel back down. Right here in the rear of the car on the trunk lid, you can see the only modification I did to this car. I wanted kind of just a little bit of a lip on the back, so put kind of like a rubber spoiler on there. I think it looks pretty good versus, you know, how it comes stock. Excuse don't make noise when they start up, just so you know. Contrary to what people tell you, the sound doesn't come out of here or here either. It's actually here. You can see it. That's the little noisemaker. So it's really underneath the bumper of the car. All right, here's the car. Took it outside for a test drive. Looks pretty darn good. You know, I've really enjoyed my ownership with this car. However, there have been a bunch of problems that I ran into, and uh, I'm gonna address those and go over that in the next few weeks. I had a battery issue, a traction motor issue, a differential issue, and I'll be going over that in the next few episodes. And in fact, we'll be disassembling this car and completely taking it apart. So if you're interested in videos like this, definitely wanna subscribe because you wanna be updated when I post those videos, I'm going to go drive my car. <laughs>